Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our next episode of Rewalk's Topics in Neurorehabilitation webcast. I'm Kathleen O'Donnell, and today we'll be talking with Professor So Sho James Chang. James is an assistant professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, and is also the administrative director of the Neuro Recovery Research Center and scientist at Tier Memorial Hermann. Combining his educational backgrounds in physical therapy and human movement science, James's research focuses on neuromotor recovery after neurological injuries, emphasizing the effects and underlying mechanisms of neuromuscular modulation and robotic assisted rehabilitation on locomotion, mobility, and community integration. His talk today will provide an introduction to wearable exoskeletons for locomotor training, and will highlight some of the key findings from his exoskeleton research. Hi, James. It's great to talk with you today. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. James, I'm, I'm really looking forward to your talk today because, you know, you are somewhat unique in that you've been involved in so many different exoskeleton devices and different studies for various therapeutic goals. Uh, so I know you're going to have a lot of insights and, and really a unique perspective to share with our viewers. And speaking of our viewers, I'd love to hear from all of you as well. Um, to know, you know, what are some of the therapeutic or lifestyle goals that you use exoskeletons to help facilitate with your own clients? So let us know your thoughts in the comments, and please remember to like and subscribe to this video if you want to see more talks like this one. And with that, James, I'm going to let you take things from here. Hey, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the, uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, so the next topic uh, is the uh, wearable exoskeleton for locomotor training. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to do a broad overview of the EXO project and the clinical application that we do in our research center at TIER, and a little bit about inpatient and outpatient use of exoskeleton. Um, in previous, uh, we will talk a lot of, uh, I think many, great clinicians and researchers are talking about specific topic in terms of drug food, in terms of how to use uh, explicit device. For me, I think um, I will bring my perspective and our team's perspective in how to use the exoskeleton. Uh, if you have any specific questions, definitely um, welcome to contact us and I'll put, we'll share our experience with you. So disclosure, I don't have any financial disclosure related to this presentation. Uh, I have to click, I have to disclose that I'm a principal investigator on the UTTL side on the WISE trial and also the uh, rework robotic trials looking at the post-market analysis. Also, I'm a co-investigator of the um, Restore trial that are sponsored by the rework robotics. Uh, definitely have to thank all the teams and collaborators working in the Web Exoskeleton Center. Uh, definitely the uh, CMO at TIER and director of the Neuro Recovery Research Center, Gerard Francisco, and also our great therapist, Marcy Kern, Erin Edenfield, and um, Katie Nedley, who's OT, but she's great in using exoskeleton, believe it or not. <laughs> um, also the collaborators that uh, work together to get grants in, from NIDLA and uh, National Science Foundation. I also want to thank Mr. Connect, Member Herman, and uh, Multiple Sclerosis Society for sponsor uh, our project. So um, uh, uh, at the beginning, I want to say that using robot is to help the therapist clinician to do a great job. It's not to steal our jobs. Don't worry about it, they won't. <laughs> so it, it provides an option for treatment. And um, when we use a robot, we, use, we think about how to promote, how to facilitate the function of the patients so it's not based on the diagnosis, not from CVA or SCI or MS, no, it's based on the function. Um, and compared to other strategies, um, we think at this point, we still don't have data to show that using web exoskeleton we're able to reduce therapist effort and burden. That's why I put a question mark there. We don't have the data yet. Um, and the good thing is based on experience, it's great to motivate the patient, uh, motivate the users, because wow, I am using exoskeleton, so I'm gonna put it on IG, Facebook, all the social medias. So it's kind of motivate the patients a little bit more instead of you know have them just standing on the standing frames, kind of, so what? Um, so there's kind of um, advantage of using it. 
Um, so one way to use robot uh, can be based on the phase of rehab. For example, using the gait ambulation training, um, at the beginning of rehabilitation phases, uh, we are looking at probably doing the um, mobilization, having them to stand up, and gradually we'll have them to go to the um, step initiation, range of motion, all of these pre gait trainings. In the end, then we're going to have them to do stepping, right? The overground training, use the treadmills, and also um, try the dual testing or talk and walk at the same time. And um, we in, in, also increase the endurance, for example, and hopefully prepare them to go back to the home and community. So, wow. So then we have so many exoskeletons and robotic devices. Is that an ideal situation that we can put them in each different phases of rehab? Um, so right now I have you know, local med, we have um, a treadmill, we have um, by the way, support systems, the exoskeleton, the eye care, the uh, walkers. So those are the great technologies. So we can kind of, kind of well, depends on research data showing that we can pay, uh, put them into different phase of uh, uh, gate rehab, just the gate rehab at this point. Also, we can uh, look at using the exoskeleton in based on the settings. So based on the settings, meaning that in inpatient rehab program, um, right now at United States, because of insurance with the payment system, we can only give the experience, um, give, provide the experience for the patient to use the technology. For example, up to six sessions during 21 days of rehab. Um, the purpose is to get them to, okay, this is technology that is available in the market. So when you are discharged, when you go to outpatient or go to other facilities, you may ask for it. Maybe they can help you. Uh, for outpatient awareness program, for example, we can use the technology to induce neuroplasticity, for example. We can use it to maintain the, the, the capability of walking. And for home use, if a device is approved or designed for home use, then you definitely can take the home and, improve, um, for, and what was it, promote independence and also will help the social reintegration, which is important, not for COVID-19 situation at this point, but uh, if once that's passed, then we're able to use that again and go out to go social events, go to the bowl games, for example. So let's go back to wearable exos, go to wearable exoskeleton. So this is the how this is the six exoskeletons we have currently at the TMM Herman. So we have Rewalk, uh, we have EXO, in they go, Rex, H2, and P legs. Sounds a lot, yes, they have six devices, different functionalities and different purposes. For example, uh, we have Rewalk. That is the first device that we purchased. And it's designed for home use. Um, so we, um, after validation, we, we did pilot studies um, and look at the feasibility and safeties. And we decided to put it into outpatient because that is more suitable in that settings. For inpatient, probably not. Um, so we, for inpatient, we decided to use EXO. We have EXO 1.1 and, and, and GT. And we found that that is more suitable to use in inpatient settings because um, at TIR, we, um, the patients receiving inpatient are more severe. Uh, so the, I believe the uh, patient in, mix index is high. You know, it's above 2.0, so it's pretty severe. So, you, um, and because of that, we decided to purchase Rex. And now Rex is a um, self-standing, uh, I would say fully automatic. Um, it's controlled by a joystick. Uh, as long as you can use your hand or a therapist can control the joystick, you are able to walk for you. Um, also, you will be able to do some functional activities such as squatting, standing, single length stands. All of that will be able to do, uh, will be really beneficial for pre get training. Uh, we have Indigo, and we like to Indigo in the outpatient settings uh, because it's, again, is uh, designed for home use, which is a great um, case, a great example for continuum care of rehab. Now, H2 and PLEX, they are developed in the research laboratory. It's not been uh, validated or approved by FDA. So we use it in the research center. What we're, we're conducting a few studies to looking at, again, safety, feasibilities, and especially we're looking at how to use PLEX, the pediatric exoskeleton in, in that population. 
So here's an example that we, um, we use uh, exoskeleton for, patient, for patients with multiple sclerosis. So this patient is a um, 52 years old male and he has uh, RMS and with EDSS score eight. You can see he, he doesn't really have leg movement that much. So when he um, walk, he kind of swing, use a swing through gait. Um, so when we put it, uh, put him with a rewalk, um, well, he's a little bit, I won't say overweight, but a little bit weight. So we use the uh, a vector body weight, uh, body weight support tra uh, system, um, setting system to help the therapist, Marcy Kern, to um, um, help the balance, prevent falls, which is important. When you use exoskeleton, how to prevent falls is really important. And also you can see that Marcy is trying to help the balance and trying to guide the hip motions, all of the things that has to help at the same time. Um, and, um, and we did a pilot study looking at how to use exoskeleton uh, to help pay, to improve gaits in patients with uh, spinal cord injury. And we did a pilot study and um, we have about, uh, six patients, uh, six subjects, and we random, seven subjects, randomized them into two um, different groups. For the EXO group, uh, we give them 15 trainings, and um, the uh, convention group, conventional PT group is um, just have them to do regular exercise, or regular PT training, for example, gait. And what we found that um, both groups actually improved uh, in terms of gait speed. Um, the um, exo group improved significantly in the stride length and cadence. Um, the um, also, uh, exo group also increased significantly in six minute walk test, six minute walk, walking longer. Uh, unfortunately, there's no group di differences um, in, uh, we found in this trial, which is not bad. I mean, it's a, it's a pilot study with seven subjects. Um, it is it's well exciting. Um, this this reason that we think that using EXO um, in terms of the technology were able to help the patient. And we also did a study with patients with multiple sclerosis. Uh, we used the same training strategies, 15 sessions, and we, um, it's a single arm study, all the patients, 10 subjects using exoskeleton. And what we found is after uh, training, the walking speed, self-select will be improved, and also the oxygen consumption reduced during walking. And I think this is very important because we think of using exoskeleton um, um, in two ways. One is as a training and one is as a um, 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 assistive device. So using this exoskeleton from this result, we can show that there's some therapeutic benefits of using exoskeleton. Um, the, again, small study, and we have a larger study going on, which is going to show you next slide. So this slide um, shows that um, the current large study is called algorithm approach for evaluation treatment for exoskeleton. Uh, we have um, the users, the patient to use two to four different exoskeleton depends on the availability. Remember that we have different exoskeleton in different settings. So if you want to use the research, you have to grab them from the outpatient and come in. Anyhow, so we, uh, for this study, we uh, investigate the using exoskeleton in patients with SCI, uh, CVA, multiple sclerosis. And the idea is to look at, um, to identify factors that contribute to the use of different exoskeleton in, um, in those population, and hopefully we're able to develop um, more effective and more individualized uh, training program in using this technology. Again, every technology is different. Uh, I'm gonna show you this. This is a Rex. Um, like I said, you can use the joystick to control the robots. Probably not suitable for patients with high functioning, um, um, who has capability to work pretty well. Um, uh, and from this, uh, we have we collect some pilot data, and we're able to publish a um, a pilot preliminary study, uh, preliminary result, uh, looking at a user's um, feedback in using two different exoskeletons. One is um, Rex, and the other one is Exo. 
the project is still ongoing. Um, so from the results is what we found is in general, the users are really happy to use different technologies and they have really positive feedback. Of course, it's not a fair com you know, comparison because they are designed for different purposes. But the idea is to look at how the user to think about this technology. And they are looking forward as a, as a patient, they are looking forward to have more user-friendly, lightweight, um, 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 I can't remember which one, which, oh, longer battery life. That is very important for some reason, they like it. Um, but they said two hours continued use is not enough. So looking for really think about how to use this technology in your daily life. Think about it, when you go to work, you're not going to change your battery every two hours. There's no battery in your bag. So you have to think about how to use the technology in the daily life and engineers or clinicians who, who, who are interested in developing technology has to think about that way. So based on the lead review and based on our, uh, uh, our um, research at our in institute, we think that uh, we need more research. We definitely need high level evidence looking at the effectiveness of using robotic devices or exoskeleton in locomotion training, low physiological changes, for example. Uh, one of the study are talking about using exoskeleton to improve bone density, which is very important, especially for patients with spinal cord injury, right? Because right after the injuries, the bone density start to go down. Um, and also we we'll definitely need to look at Maybe there's a new muscular adaptation we will lead to functional changes and it needs a long-term trainings. So one of the example we have, one of the limitation in our um, project, current project is, it's a research, so we weren't able to, we are not able to provide a unlimited training sessions. So 15 sessions, 12 sessions, 36 sessions, 60 sessions, it's, it, it's a limitation. And, um, um, but we have to think about that. Um, of course, we assume there's an unlimited resources the patient can use. So we'll provide it and you can use it for long term, which is very important for neuroplasticity, right? But with the current US healthcare settings, when you have only 15 sessions, you have only 12 sessions, how can we use technology more efficiently? Also, we need to look at the activity based on ICF models, mobility. How can we use that for transportation? Right, because think about that, you're going to take a flight. How can you use exoskeleton to take a flight? And definitely there's a lot of um, uh, research, researchers are interested in looking at participation, social integration, how to use that for recreation, which is again, very important um, in our daily life. All right, so um, away from the uh, research side, how we can advance the uh, technology, right? So one of very important is have a lighter weight exoskeleton. So I'm gonna show you this. This is a study we did, I did um, back in 2012 and 13. We have the NASA X1 exoskeleton. It's designed for astronauts to use in space, not for environment with gravity. So it's really heavy, I believe it's 200 pounds. That device is 200 pounds. So we think you should have a Hoya lift to lift the device and the patient to walk. Well, <laughs> it, it, it sounds funny, but it's really, really uh, uh, impressive that the, the subject able to walk with the device. Now this is uh, Go um, H2 or now it's called Hank. It's really lightweight. I believe it's only 15 pounds weight. It's in Europe. It's not FDA approved in the United States yet. So you can see in five to six years, the technology involved um, regularly. And, and also we should have the um, uh, robotic devices with different design and materials such as soft exoskeleton. So uh, remember when we talked in the pet, uh, earlier that I'm involved in the real world resource research, uh, uh, pro, uh, clinical trial. And that's a great example of how um, we were able to uh, use a different motors, the design of the motors to provide assistance and resistance in um, different joints. I believe at this trial is an ankle and um, um, uh, Dr. Connor Walsh has a different devices for the knee and then for the hip. So this is a great, great, great invention that we're able to use in rehabilitation science and rehabilitation uh, for patients with neurological disorders. 
And not just for neural patients, we can also use it for um, auto patients. So think about it, they were able to um, um, use that for um, um, uh, tendon relief, all these injuries or uh, for surgeries. Um, Now, real life situation. So, when you want to use the technology, what is the challenges and opportunities? So, uh, as um, hospital administrators, as administration managers, you have to think about cost effectiveness. These are not cheap devices, I can tell you, but they're not cheap. They're really expensive. Um, also, how the, the training for the patient, for the users, um, the therapist to use devices that is, is quite high, the cost is quite high. And it comes up, it's a reason because first is safety. We need to make sure that therapies are really trained, we're certified, so we're able to use it with the patient with a peace of mind. Um, staff, uh, staff education and training. The, this part is not looking at the training of the use as a skeleton. I think we have to train the staff, your clinicians, uh, how this rehab field change from 20, 30 years ago. 20, 30 years ago, we don't have robotic devices. No, everything is by your hands. Right? When you get training, you have to squat down and move the hip like this way and this way. Now you don't do that. The robot will able to help you and you're able to determine the parameters, how fast, step length, step angles, all of that you're able to do. So you're able, those clinicians probably away from school so, so long they're able to understand why you use technology. So, Training, meaning the education, kind of education is important, how to tell the clinicians. We have a great tool that you can use to help yourself, to help um, to, uh, to prevent your back pain, for example. Now, use of use and durability. Um, this, is, uh, this is the universal problem for devices, right? Lifetime, five years, 10 years, like a car. But think about you're buying a Mercedes or BMW that like will last 20, 20 years. Um, um, that is, that this, for me, it's a kind of challenges we are facing because in 10 years, we'll have new device coming in. But if you like the device so much, we don't want to, we don't want to get rid of it, All right? Um, also, the upper, another opportunity I think that we can use is as a primary therapy, and also we can use it as adjunct programs, for example. Um, we don't believe that using SO skin alone will able to replace the conventional therapy because, remember, we, that, there's many techniques that has to be provided by hand. Uh, and so scanning will only provide one aspect of the training. Repetition, for example. Stimulation a little bit, for example. Give it a resistance example. So I think it's up to the uh, clinicians and therapists' hands, their mind, um, how to use it for their needs. I think that's very important. Um, of course, there's opportunity to develop other mo model of care. For example, awareness program. Um, um, I believe one of hospitals, we have hospitals that have the wellness program that provide exoskeleton as a standalone program. Um, regardless of who pays for it, but I think it's great for people who are able to um, either afford it or able to um, get the resources and help them to get better. And that's all I have today. James. Thanks for a great talk and some really exciting insights from your research. You know, one of the things that I really enjoyed about your talk is really the breadth of the research that you presented, exploring the use of exoskeletons in you know, a variety of populations with a variety of different goals and at a variety of different timescales within that rehabilitation process. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you a few follow-up questions. And the first one is really going back to that idea of using exoskeletons at different timescales. Um, you know, across the continuum of rehabilitative care. One of the, one of your slides really highlighted, you know, all the different places in the inpatient and the outpatient and the wellness programs where exoskeletons could potentially come into play. Um, I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit more on kind of your vision for, you know, let's assume that a patient with SCI had access to robotic technology at every phase in their recovery. Um, how, how, what would that look like? Or how might they use exoskeletons at different phases to maximize their progression and their rehabilitation? Well, it's a, it's a big, big, <laughs> big question. It's a big question, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I think the challenge for um, ACI rehab, 
is that we're dealing with many issues, right? not just for the injuries. Um, so the goal of the, the rehab at each, uh, each phase really depends on um, the goal of that patient, the goal of at that time. Um, it changes every day. Right. If locomotion is one of the goal, then we start early and don't wait. The reason we said don't wait is based on research. Right now, most of the studies are in chronic patients. Um, if we can start early, we can start in inpatient, even just using treadmills, using exoskeleton if it's available. If we use it, just use this um, um, uh, FES bike, for example. You have to start early. Right. Also, um, don't think that using exoskeleton is the only way, is the only way. You definitely think about how the patient is going to, go, where is the patient is going to go. Um, we are in the technology era that we are lucky to have those available, uh, those de devices available. And um, definitely, I think it's up to the clinician's mind how to, how to use it. Um, I won't able to tell you that how, <laughs> how, you should use that or anyone you use it because every situation is different. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I answer your question. I'm sorry. No, I, th I think it's a, I think it's a great point to, to recognize that there's, there's a lot of different, you know, goals and there's a lot of different functional impairments. And so trying to meet each patient where they're at in terms of what are their current goals and what are their current impairments. Um, I think it's just a good overall strategy um, in terms of how to follow them along with their progression. Excellent. So, I also, I really appreciated your, your, you know, closing slides where we, we kind of come back to some of the real world challenges and, and the opportunities for incorporating advanced technologies into clinical practice. Um, and in particular, one of the things that you really emphasized was that educational component to the clinicians, not just from a technical level, but from a, you know, a change in clinical practice level. Uh, so I'm just curious if you have any insights from your experience for, for sort of a game plan for how to effectively evaluate or introduce new technologies into your clinic? You'd like to ask great questions. <laughs> <laughs> I try. <laughs> well, they're great questions because I think, um, like I said in the, uh, earlier, that I think we're in the area that we're going to have advanced technology coming in every two, every one, every year, every two years. I, for a person, I'm overwhelmed. Um, so in terms of how to use the technology effectively, um, efficiently, hospitals or clinicians, um, when they decided, when they considered to use the technology, not just for exoskeleton robotic devices, they really have to carefully evaluate their needs. And that means that the population they serve, what type of patient they see, what type of functional level patient, what level of patient they treat, um, the settings, for example, inpatient, outpatients, um, and also the data, the science behind it. Um, the administrator folks, I, I'm sure they're looking at how much does it cost? How much does it cost for, for me to send five therapists to the training for two days or three days? I mean, that's cost they have to, uh, to think about. Um, uh, it takes time. It is the homework that everybody has to do before they adapt any technology. Um, 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 so I think that there's no single game plan that everybody should use. I think it really depends on your need, your situation. Um, I definitely do not suggest that uh, as a personal point of view is to purchase device because other facility has one. And that is not a great strategy. It's not good for work. Um, how uh, treating patients perspective. Um, you really need to think about which device, which technology that your patient will use most. And that is very important. That was a great answer. Uh, no, I, I think that really makes a lot of sense. Is there's so many different devices out there and, and every one of them is unique in terms of what it's able to do and what exactly. it's able to provide. Yep. Yep. Um, so it really takes a little bit of, of homework, as you said, to, to really yep. understand those differences and figure out what's going to be the, the best choice for each facility. Great point. Um, and, and lastly, you know, for, for any of our viewers who would like to learn more about uh, either exoskeletons in general or your exoskeleton research, are there any resources or, or references that you can recommend uh, to help them get started? 
Um, yes. Um, first, uh, firstly, that um, I'm more than happy to share our experience. Um, again, as a scientist, we like to share. Uh, we like to share our experience, our results. Um, um, we're also open for uh, collaboration. If any scientists and research researchers, clinician out there, all over the world that they want to, you know, work together, definitely uh, you can feel free to contact me. Um, I believe there will be an email down here. <laughs> um, and um, for readers, for, for people who would like to read, definitely go to PubMed or Google Scholars to search exoskeleton. I believe you are going to um, um, find um, I was hundreds of papers in exoskeleton from lead review, from meta-analysis, from design of the different exoskeletons, from clinical trials. I mean, it's a broad range and really good uh, overview of the, um, of the field. Um, uh, if you definitely want to know specific device or this specific, uh, um, um, have a specific question, definitely feel free to uh, contact us. Great, and I'll actually include links to um, your facility and, and also some of your reference papers that you've published as well so that our, our viewers can find those pretty easily in the description below. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much for a great talk, James, and thank you so much for your time. Not a problem. Pleasure to be here. And to our viewers, we hope you've been finding these talks interesting and helpful. So don't forget to reach out in the comments section with some of the ways that you train your clients to use exoskeletons to help them meet their specific therapeutic or lifestyle goals. And please also make sure to like and subscribe to this video using the buttons below. You can also use the comments section to suggest any future talks or speakers that you would like to see from this series. And we hope you will tune in with us again next episode. Take care, everyone.